This is now chapter five, yes. So using your own words, describe 1920s America. Within your response, detail new forms of entertainment, key figures, increased prosperity, conflicts and issues that many Americans encountered. So again, I'll give you a little bit more time to work on this just because it's a longer bell ringer. Bless you. How's it going? You check with the office? Okay. You can keep that then. Thank you. Just working on the bell ringer.
All right, so the 1920s, they call it the Roaring Twenties. Why do they call it the Roaring Twenties? What do we think? Tanner, go ahead. Yeah, good job. So there's an economic prosperity in the United States because of the Great War, because of World War I. And how did that come about? How did the United States grow even more as an industrial power, as an economic power, and even agricultural power after World War I? Gail, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, good job. So all these European countries that were developed that went through industrialization that uh, obviously contributed to the market, uh, they were all destroyed. Okay, they're going through some harsh times. Yeah, the war never really fought on, in, on the island of Great Britain. But at the same time, uh, they lost a generation of men. Okay, they lost a lot of people that would fill the industries, the factories. We really didn't. Okay, we really didn't. So we weren't affected from the war nearly as much as these other European countries. And this made a sort of a dependence. These European countries needed to depend on the United States for manufacturing, for growth, to rebuild. And what was that plan called at the end of World War I? We'll refer to this here soon enough, moving into World War II. Cassidy, the Dawes Plan, good job. So this was a way to try to inspire economic growth in Western Europe. 
okay, and to try to help rebuild Germany so that they can pay back these reparations to the Allied powers. So overall, we can see the United States growing even more as an industrial power thanks to World War I. And this is what brought a lot of prosperity to the United States. And I'm not saying these progressive movements weren't beneficial or helpful to help with these people that are making a lower wage or facing poor, unsafe, unsanitary conditions in the workplace. But a lot of that had to do with really the changing times after World War I, where people had increased time to do whatever they want after work. And this was the emergence of modern United States okay, uh, society. Uh, so a modern society in the US where people can get involved in entertainment purposes, okay, like baseball games, okay, the emergence of the radio, you name it. Well, I don't wanna give them all of them away, but uh, what other key figures can we talk about during this time era? Or what other conflicts can you mention during the 1920s that we talked about? What do you think? Eddie, what did you write? What did you say? Well, I said the Roman Empire was also an environment of the entertainment Yeah, good job. And the people like Charlie Chaplin became famous for their acting. Yeah, so silent films with Charlie Chaplin. Okay, he was world renowned. Okay, everybody knew him around the world because of his famous silent film skits, right? You also can mention Steamboat Willie, so animated films. And uh, we also talked about amazing feats like with Charles Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic Ocean and really. This, uh, describing about how the plane was revolutionizing during this time and how it's changing for the better uh, with these new innovations during this time period. All right, and you can just really talk about the standard of living. It rose uh, tremendously during this time period and how uh, people were affording more products, more goods, and really didn't have to depend too much on the government. And we talked a lot about that okay, after World War I and this return to normalcy. You guys remember talking about return to normalcy? President Harding, okay. So after the struggles of World War I with Woodrow Wilson, increasing government's role in society, we thought as a country, we should stay back, that the government should keep their hands out of the economy and let it work itself. And throughout the 1920s, we see this economic boom. We see this economic prosperity. All right, I just wanted to wrap that up and describe a little bit about the time era. Okay, we also mentioned about the Harlem Renaissance with new forms of entertainment like the jazz era. We talked a little bit about organized crime through prohibition okay, and how Al Capone and figures like that uh, rose to power and became larger than life. Everybody knew who these people were and they're breaking the law and getting away with it. And it just shows that this prohibition era really wasn't favored by many people, even politicians and police authority. Okay, so the 1920s, definitely a neat time. And uh, we call it a return to normalcy, but we all know it really wasn't much that. Right, this fundamentalist versus modernist charge okay, with uh, traditional values, religious values, challenging new theories in science and secular views. Okay, the Scopes trial, we mentioned that as well. So there's a lot going on. Okay, but for the most part, this is modern society in America okay, where people can enjoy themselves after work. And they don't have to be working long hours in these industries and in these coal mines okay, like previous times. All right, here are your terms for today. I just wanted to summarize that with you guys because the 1920s is something to discuss, especially getting involved in this new chapter of the Great Depression and how it all comes kind of piling down. All right, so we got Herbert Hoover, the Great Depression, and Black Tuesday. We'll talk more about Hoover and uh, maybe his answers to the Great Depression more on Monday.
All right, what do we got for Herbert Hoover? Who's Herbert Hoover? Matt, what do you have? Okay, good job. Good job. So he's the president of the United States during the Great Depression, unfortunately, right? And uh, a lot of people say it was just bad timing. It's nothing that he really did. It just occurred, and, um, and uh, there's just kind of no stopping it. Uh, later in his career, he thought, well, we could do some change where government can maybe get involved to try to stop the Great Depression and uh, maybe try to help benefit the standard of living in the United States, which we'll see more increased projects of his, like the Hoover Dam, for instance, where this is trying to generate power to Southwest United States. So we'll get to that here soon enough, right? Probably more on Monday and how he tried to contribute to really stop the effects of the Great Depression. Right? But again, kind of unfortunate timing. He was kind of in this long string of Republican presidents after World War I, where they're just letting the good times roll, letting the economy just do its thing and have government stay out of uh, the workings of the economy. And things were going well, obviously, through the Roaring Twenties. But unfortunately, something's going to come to a crash with this overproduction. All right, the Great Depression, we'll mention that. Black Tuesday. What's Black Tuesday? Make sure you guys write the day down here. I think it's important. Chloe, go ahead. Yeah, good job. Good. So October 29th, 1929, this was when the stock market crashed. And uh, many people were running to try to take their shares and their, their um, stocks of the stock market. And uh, this overall collapsed the United States economy. And if this is collapsed in the U.S. economy, what do you think is happening in Europe and really the rest of the world? Kale, what do you think? So with the Dawes plan, everybody is dependent on U.S. production, right, and manufacturing, and really our basis of our economy. So if we crash, the rest of the world crashes, even worse, right? Germany, who is dependent on the United States manufacturing and business and really surplus stimulus, that's all gone. Right? So this is going to really throw them in a uh, whirlwind of problems and issues, which is going to lead to a rise of dictators in Europe. Okay, so not only did this affect the United States, this affected the whole world, because after World War I, it was on our plate to try to rebuild the rest of the world. We're the only industrial power left. And uh, once we go down, so the rest of the world. Okay, so like I mentioned, we're going to start off uh, talking about Herbert Hoover. And sometimes he gets a bad rap. And like I mentioned, it's kind of an unfortunate event for him. Uh, with the Great Depression, he just kind of fell into a spot where things were just declining and there's really no stop. And uh, for him, he tried to transition towards the end of his presidency to enact public works programs. But uh, it was just too little too late. So this picture up here, that's the Dust Bowl. Okay, that's one of the black blizzards I mentioned yesterday. Like I said, it kind of looks like a snowstorm coming, but in all reality, that's dirt, that's debris uh, flying across the Midwest. And uh, this was really because of four, poor farming techniques uh, for many, many years after World War I, where uh, many of these farmers were just continuing to grow crops and produce crops to a point where this caused many environmental impacts across the United States. And these black blizzards would travel the length of the nation all the way across to the East Coast. And many people reported in New York City seeing these black blizzards and to a point where it actually blacked out the sun in many cases. And uh, people couldn't walk around outside. Right. Obviously, if that would get in your eyes, your mouth, you'd be facing a lot of problems. So people that were walking around in these black blizzards and this dust bowl and this dust storm, they'd have to wear cloths around their face. OK. And uh, to try to protect themselves. It looked like they're literally walking through the desert. But this is just Midwest United States and even traveling to the East Coast, kind of where we live. So it was just this amazing phenomenon due to poor farming techniques and practices uh, in the 1920s. 
All right, so that person down here, we talked about this term yesterday in the pretest. So the bottom picture, who, who would that be? Who would that be? So this is a person that lost his living, lost his farm, maybe the foreclosures because of the Great Depression. And uh, he's traveling around the Midwest looking to the West for better opportunities. Tanner? An Oki. Yep, good job. Good job. So again, kind of living out on his own, traveling place to place, a wander in a way looking for more opportunities as he was affected through this dust bowl, through this Great Depression. And then top right picture, we'll talk about this. These are bread lines. Okay, this would be placed outside of many urban areas, many communities around the nation where people would literally get fed. And uh, this was their only source of food because it was very scarce. And uh, many people couldn't even just feed themselves during this time because they lost everything through the stock market crash, through the Great Depression. So sad, unfortunate events. All right, so like I said, spanning from 1929, really up until 1939, to the United States involvement in World War II in 1941. All right, so hidden problems. Herbert Hoover was elected in 1928 as president. And he thought, well, we're just gonna keep the good times rolling. We thought as, as the United States moving through this 1920s, that this would never end, that this increased prosperity, the time of entertainment, and uh, this new modern society that the United States would just continue to prosper at alarming rates. And like I mentioned, the rest of the world was dependent on US production and manufacturing through the Dulles plant. So things were going really well. Okay, so Herbert Hoover, as he was elected president, he really didn't have to do too much. Many of these presidents before him, okay, they just kind of sat back, relaxed and let the good times roll because it was just one of those situations where he didn't have to do too much as a president. Uh, obviously, with the economy booming after World War I, kind of just step back, relax, let it roll. So his famous quote, he believed that chicken in every pot, a car in every garage, meaning that people can afford these new luxury styles of, uh, of goods and products like a car. Every family can afford it. Uh, every family can feed their family. Right? They have the ability to purchase these items and even a little bit more. So just the prosperity of the United States, the standard of living was so high when he became president, that he just thought we're going to have a hands-off approach and we're just going to let the economy roll. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, obviously. So tough times for farmers. So when you think of the Great Depression, you think of the stock market crash. You think about industry, manufacturing that was impacted. But farming actually was hit hard. Okay, It was hit first. And the reason for it is because building up to World War I as the United States was getting involved in 1917, we encourage our farmers to produce as much crops as possible uh, so that we could feed our soldiers overseas and that we could, uh, that we could uh, overcome the issues in, in Europe against the central powers. And the way we're going to do that as the United States, because we weren't developed, we weren't modernized just yet comparable to these other European countries, well, food, agriculture, and that's what really benefited us to win this war. We just had so much supplies on hand as we're becoming the strongest industrial power in the world. Okay. Yeah, we weren't ready for the war, but just the sheer supplies and armaments that we could produce was just uncomparable uh, on the central power side. And food was definitely one of the biggest. So as we're, move, as we're moving through the 1920s, okay, food became a, uh, a commodity for many Americans as they could afford it. Right? Prices dropped so, so low to a point everybody didn't, uh, many people didn't have an issue feeding their family. But as these farmers continue to produce goods and crops, no one had told them to stop. No one told them to have some sort of regulation. So the farmers continue to produce crops and food uh, to a point where it became worthless. And the price of these goods became so low that it really wasn't, uh, it really wasn't helping or benefiting them paying back some of the loans to the banks that they reached out to the banks to grow their farms, grow their plantations, buy equipment. Okay, and buy these new innovations like tractors and eventually maybe combines at this point. So uh, these farmers really outstretched themselves because of the high demand during World War I. And after that, no one ever told them to stop. No one ever told them to have some sort of regulation on the production of food. So many of these farms, many of these uh, people lost everything because they couldn't pay back the loans to the banks as they're overstretching themselves to reach that high demand. So this is kind of a picture of a farm foreclosure, 1927, and just showing how, uh, again, this is kind of the first impact in our society of the Great Depression. 
already in 1927. Right? Many of these farmers are facing foreclosures and really, really problematic times. And eventually this is gonna cause many farmers to actually just destroy their crops, destroy their products, because if they're viewed as this low of a price, it's worthless. And many of these farmers weren't gaining the right compensation for their work. So there's actually many pictures of farmers just destroying their crops, destroying their products, um, and just really heaps of piles of burning it up. And it just goes to show that they weren't represented, that they weren't getting their fair share uh, that the government respected it by. All right, so wealth only for the rich. Okay, many of these wealthy individuals saw this coming from a mile away. Okay, actually in the Chaplin movie, I thought it was interesting when I watched it. Uh, since he was so famous at the time with his silent films, uh, he actually sold a lot of his stocks, sold a lot of his shares before the stock market hit because he kind of saw this coming, right? With a lot of these product or a lot of these companies, these industries producing goods at alarming rates, sooner or later, uh, if you keep saturating the market with oversupply, eventually these businesses are going to shut down. And so as these businesses were shutting down, these workers were without work, without making any wages, and they can't contribute to the economy. So eventually this is all gonna fall back on the people owning the stocks in these industries, in these businesses, okay, in these, in these, uh, uh, these factories. And eventually this caused a lot of issues for many people as they're buying and consuming many of these stocks, okay, and purchasing at a rate where they couldn't really even afford it. They're loaning money out from the bank to purchase these stocks and making money off of something that was just barely new at the time. It's not like today's world where you have these financial advisors telling you what to do, or you have social media uh, obviously showing you the stock prices. Okay, at this point, you didn't really have that. You have to wait a week or two to see exactly how the stocks were moving and how these industries, these factories were being impacted during this time. So people were affected tremendously by this. And eventually when the stock market crash hits, people lost everything. Like I said, they're putting their house up, their car as collateral, meaning that if they couldn't pay back the loan, well, they lost their house, they lost their car, they lost their assets because they couldn't afford any more of these stocks. And like I said, with the time of the 1920s, people just thought this was just gonna continue to roll on. But as the stock market crash hit, many people lost everything. So it all comes crashing down. So September 3rd, 1929, the market begins to fall, meaning the stocks are beginning to fall and, meaning, and uh, many of these businesses are losing a lot of their assets. Okay, again, with that oversupply of goods, uh, you can't continue, continue to add to that oversupply. The prices are gonna drop to alarming rates and these businesses are gonna start to shut down and people are out of work, meaning they can't contribute to the stock market or the, yeah, buy in stocks. They can't buy any products in the market if they're not making a wage and the consumer index is just gonna be impacted. So October 23rd stock falls 21 points per hour. So like I said, many of these wealthy individuals that might have a financial advisor that might know people within the stock market start selling their stocks to other people. So middle-class individuals thought, well, this is, uh, this is the time to buy stocks as the stock market's falling. And then finally in Black Tuesday, October 29th, that's when the stock market officially crashed. So that's what they call Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. And this is effect not only the United States, but the rest of the world, as these other countries around the world and Western Europe were affected tremendously by this. Okay, they're dependent on US manufacturing and the US economy. And once the US kind of falls, well, so does the rest of the world. And this puts the whole world in this economic depression shortly just after World War I and building up to World War II. All right, uh, last slide here. So adjusting to the new life, unemployment rose to 25%, and that was the largest it really ever been hit. 25% okay, of the working class were out of jobs. Okay, were out of any type of compensation without any wages. So you can imagine how that's going to affect the market, how it's going to affect the economy. People aren't buying products. People aren't buying stocks and uh, because they're out of a job. And this is actually a picture of a monument outside of, I believe it's New York City, where people lined up for these bread lines because they had no way of feeding themselves. And uh, it was very unfortunate, very unfortunate. So wages cut by 
And this is introduced in the bread lines in many of these areas, many of these communities, okay, these urban areas. And we'll talk about it more. Uh, eventually, Herbert Hoover is going to have to do something. And some of his answers actually impact the economy even worse. Okay, so we'll talk about the Holly Smoot tariff more tomorrow, or sorry, on Monday, and how that's going to impact the U.S. and the rest of the world decline even more into a depression. All right, is there any questions? So poor Herbert Hoover gets in office and the stock market crashes. Unfortunate. 